camera. This is not working. This is all messed up on my, on my, uh, there we go. So I want, oh, that's wrong. So I'm in trouble now. There we go, we got that, we got that. Om. Sorry about uh, my awkward um, introduction here. There we go. Good. Sorry about my awkward introduction. We're having some uh, problems with this uh, complicated technology. I'm still getting used to it. <coughs> Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahavidyan Karava Vahai Tejasvinavadhi Tamastu Mavitvisha Vahai Om Shanti 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 Om. <coughs> Welcome to our webcast. Let me just uh, check this one last time. Make sure that uh, we're not having any further problems. I'm sorry. <coughs> okay, I think it looks good. <coughs> we continue. This is our second class on Atma Bodha of Sri Shankaracharya. Uh, last week, uh, we gave a very uh, elaborate introduction to the class. I'd like to suggest that if you missed the introduction last week, it would be better if you were to watch the introduction right now, and then this live webcast is being recorded, so you can watch uh, this session later. Having continuity in these classes will be quite important, so uh, keep that in mind. <coughs> Also mentioned that the text that we use uh, is available on our website. And if you prefer to listen to audios while you're in your car or anything, audio recordings are also available on our website. Last week we introduced the text and saw the first verse. I'd like to uh, uh, review that first verse because it'll set the uh, stage for today's discussion. Um, in this very first verse, Shankara says, Atma Bodh, and the final line, Atma Bodha Vidhyate. He says, This text, Atma Bodha Vidhyate, is being composed. Composed for whom? Mumukshu Nam. For those who desire liberation. And as we said in our last week's class, liberation is not merely freedom from rebirth. Liberation is freedom from suffering here and now. This is a very important perspective of Advaita Vedanta. Liberation is both with regard to future lives, freedom from rebirth, but more importantly, liberation is freedom from suffering here and now. And then we had a lengthy discussion about if what you want is freedom from suffering, then how is Atma Bodha? Remember, Bodha, knowledge of Atma, the true self. If what you want is freedom from suffering, how is Atma Bodha, self-knowledge, going to help? <clears throat> and in our very important introduction, we discussed how the problem is one of self non-recognition. Your true self is already full, complete, to use a common language, already divine. You already are that which you want to become, to use my guru's language. You already possess that which you want to gain. Then what is the problem? The problem is that Atma is covered by a veil of ignorance and being covered by that veil of ignorance, we don't appreciate our own divinity. That divinity is hidden from us and when that divinity is hidden from us, we suffer and we suffer a lot. So the purpose of Atma Bodha then 
is to remove that veil of ignorance so we can discover that true inner divinity and discovering that true inner divinity, <clears throat> suffering comes to an end. Now, uh, Shankara uh, further talks about those for whom this text is written. And we had a nice discussion about the first line, tapo bihi kshina papa nam. This text is for those who have been purified of their papas. And we had a lovely discussion at the very end of the class. Uh, just recall it very briefly. Um, it said many times that these teachings of, the, of Atma Bodha, these teachings of Vedanta, are rarely seen for the value that they possess. Most people could care less. I'm sure if you talk to many of your friends about Vedanta, they'll say, what is all of that about? Why are you bothering? You've discovered the value of these teachings. And that is rare. In the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna says, maybe one in a thousand discover the value of these teachings. You are one of those one in a thousand. And the way Shankara expresses that in the, in the first line is that you in your prior lives have been purified of enough sin, papa karma, and you're sufficiently purified now in this life that you have value for these teachings. And that's why you're watching this webcast right now. Finally, Shankara says Shan, uh, this text is composed for those shantanam vitaraginam, those who are shanta, calm, quiet, focused, whose minds are one-pointed, and who are vitaraginam, who are free from uh, raga and duesha, free, free from desire, would we'll you say very simply. And the reason for these further qualifications, and again, just to summarize a big discussion from our prior class, what we're seeking is a very special kind of knowledge. In order to gain this very special kind of knowledge, we're going to have to, we require a very special kind of preparation. In our prior class, we said before you can study calculus, you have to study algebra, geometry, and trigonometry so that you're prepared. Here we have this extraordinary subject matter to be prepared for this particular study. There are many qualifications, many, many steps of spiritual growth that are required to prepare you for this study. And Shankara just refers to several of them here. There, there are others, but he says that in order to be prepared for this spiritual inquiry, you should be shanta, your mind should be quiet, your mind should be focused, your mind should be capable of being one-pointed and vitaraga. You should be free from desires, sufficiently free that you can focus your attention. Your main focus of life comes to this pursuit of Atma Bodha of self-knowledge. Enough introduction. We continue today with verse 2. Not surprisingly, I'm still having problems here. There we go. Okay. Okay, looks like we're okay. All right. So, um, you can repeat after me. Bodho nya sadhane bhyo hi Bodho nya sadhane bhyo hi Sakshan Mokshaika Sadhanam, Sakshan Mokshaika Sadhanam, Pakasya Van Hivagnanam, Pakasya Van Hivagnanam, Vena Mokshona Sidhyati, Vena Mokshona Sidhyati. Very good. Let me introduce. The, uh, the, the verse before we see the uh, details. Why Atma Bodha? If what you want is freedom from suffering, 
why is why is knowledge necessarily the solution why not meditation why not bhakti devotion why not raise your kundalini as many people like to do or practice yoga asanas why is the focus on bodha bodha means jnanam jnanam and bodha mean knowledge here knowledge of atma the true self Shankara answers that question in this verse. He says, Bodhaha, knowledge, knowledge of your true self, Atma, he indeed is anyasadhanebhyaha compared to anya, other, sadhanebhyaha, compared to other spiritual practices, practices like meditation, practices like bhakti yoga, etc. Compared to other spiritual practices, this bodha, this knowledge taught by Shankara in this text, is sakshat, and again, I'll remind you, when I break the words apart, the spelling changes. These are the rules of Sunday. Sakshat moksha eka sadhanam. <coughs> Breaking the words apart. This bodha, this knowledge that we're studying, is moksha eka sadhanam, is the one sadhana, the one means for gaining moksha, freedom from liberation. This knowledge is the one means for reaching liberation, for becoming free from suffering, and it is sakshat, it is the one sakshat direct. It is the one direct means for reaching moksha. Now, there are a number of issues that we really need to discuss here. First of all, to remind you from our last class, we had already discussed why this is so. We said the problem is self non-recognition. The problem is that atma is covered by that veil of ignorance. And if the problem is ignorance, the solution is not to pray more. The solution is not even to meditate more. If the problem is ignorance, we'll talk about the role of prayer and meditation in just a moment. I'm not saying they're, they're unimportant, they're crucial, but we have to see how, and we'll see in this verse. If ignorance is the problem, the solution can only be knowledge. If self-non-recognition, the failure to recognize the inner divinity, that's your essential nature, if that ignorance is the problem, the solution is knowledge. Knowledge is the eka sadhanam. It is the one means for removing ignorance. This is, this is the point that's often misunderstood today. And especially in modern times, um, many of you are familiar with uh, what can be called a doctrine of four paths. They say there are four paths to reach liberation, moksha. There is the path of jnana yoga, the path of knowledge, the path of wisdom. There's the path of karma yoga, the path of action, the path of bhakti yoga, the path of devotion, <clears throat> and the path of dhyana, meditation. It's often said there are these four paths. And then further, they'll say, the path of jnana is good for the intellectual sorts. I'm being a little sarcastic here. The path of, jnana, of karma is good for the extroverted people. The uh, path of bhakti are good for the very emotional people. Oh, my, this is my guru's joke. He said, and then there's a path of dhyana, meditation. What do they do? They just sit there. So according to Puja Swamiji, he said, the path of dhyana are for those who are good for nothing else. <laughs> They're just good for sitting and meditation. I'm being deliberately sarcastic because there's lots of confusion in this, in this whole presentation. First of all, let me make it very clear that this presentation of four paths is a fairly modern concept. When you go back and look at Shankara's works 
and other traditional scriptures, they don't say there are four paths. This is one of the many instances in which, in modern times, the wrong concept actually is more popular than the correct concept. The wrong concept is you can take any one of these four paths to reach moksha. The correct concept is it's, if the problem is ignorance, the solution is knowledge. Now, how can we reconcile these two perspectives? The ancient perspective, uh, Shankara's in Shankara's language, jnanam eva mokshaha. Knowledge is, I'm sorry, moksha is through knowledge alone. <clears throat> Contrast that with the modern idea that there are four paths through which you can reach moksha, this modern perspective. How can we, we reconcile these? We're going to spend some time about this. You notice that word sakshat in the text. So we're going to make a distinction between a direct means and auxiliary means. Let me set that aside. We'll see that in the second half of the verse. So let me set it aside and deal with this, with this four-path misconception. It's a modern, modern idea. Um, they often say there are many paths up the mountain. To get to the top of the mountain, suppose there's a temple, a beautiful temple on top of the mountain. You want to get up to the temple. There are many paths up the mountain. So modern people will sometimes say there are many paths to reach moksha. But again, if the problem is ignorance, are there many ways of removing ignorance? Prayer in and of itself doesn't remove ignorance. Karma yoga in and of itself doesn't remove ignorance. Even meditation in and of itself doesn't remove ignorance. Knowledge removes ignorance. So you can see the logic that establishes that there aren't many paths. So the updated metaphor, there are many paths up the mountain to reach the temple. But the temple on top of the mountain has one entrance. <laughs> so there may be many paths up the mountain, but there's only one way to get inside the temple. That updated metaphor suggests that there are many spiritual practices which can help us, uh, help us gain spiritual growth. Going up the mountain, I suppose, is symbolic of gaining spiritual growth, all of which are necessary. If you don't go up the mountain, how will you ever get into the temple? So karma yoga is necessary, bhakti is necessary, dhyana, meditation is necessary, but enable to get inside the temple in order to gain moksha. What is ultimately required is jnanam knowledge. Now Shankara is going to explain that in more detail in the second half of this verse using a metaphor. As I said in the introductory class, this text is full of these delightful metaphors. We call them drishtanta. And here we see the first one. Pakasya vanhivat jnanam vena mokshaha navidyate. We'll start with the second part. Jnanam vena, without knowledge, mokshaha nasidhyati. Moksha, freedom from suffering, cannot be a acquired. Why? As we said, knowledge alone destroys the ignorance, ignorance which is the cause of suffering. Can I say that again? Ignorance of your true nature is the cause for suffering. Therefore, jnanam vina, without this knowledge of your true self, moksha nasadhyati, moksha Freedom from suffering cannot be attained. And here's the wonderful metaphor, the first of many. <clears throat> pakasya vanhivat. Pakasya. For, paka means cooking. Pakasya. For cooking, vanhivat. Just like fire for cooking. And this, this is a, a, a two-word reference to a very elaborate teaching a very important 
teaching, and I'd like to share that with you right now. In order to cook, there is a primary means and several secondary means. The word sakshat came here as primary means. If you like Sanskrit, the word arat means secondary. So there's a primary means for cooking and a secondary means for cooking. Suppose you have some rice you want to cook. What's the primary means for cooking? He says, vanhi, fire. Fire is the primary means for cooking. Fire cooks. That's the primary means. But there are secondary means. And those secondary means are also important. Can you cook, a f can you cook rice without a pot? Can you cook rice without water? Can you serve that rice without a spoon? Now notice, these are examples of secondary means. And notice that the pot doesn't cook the rice, but without a pot, you can't cook the rice. Water doesn't cook the rice, but without water, you can't cook rice. Fire cooks rice. And this is the distinction Shankaracharya is making here between sakshat, the primary means, and secondary means. Bodha, knowledge, is the primary means for gaining moksha, freedom from suffering. Why? As we said too many times already, knowledge destroys the ignorance that makes you suffer. But, just like you can't cook rice without a pot and water <coughs> and spoon, we'll just throw that in, in the same way, you can't get this knowledge, you can't get moksha. Sorry, let me not mix up the metaphor. Just like you can't cook, if you have fire, you, can't, you still can't cook unless you also have a pot, water, and spoon. In the same way, <clears throat> for the sake of moksha, liberation, freedom from suffering, in addition to knowledge, you also need these secondary means, which, which means, you also need bhakti, devotion. You also need karma yoga. You also need dhyana. You may need other things as well. Notice these are secondary means. So this is the correct way of understanding this four path thing. There are, we can count four. If you want to count four, there's no problem. We can actually count more than four but we'll stay with these four common ones. So jnana, knowledge, karma, uh, bhakti, and dhyana, meditation. We'll just take those four. As I said, we can account more than four, but for right now, these four are good. The problem is when you say four paths, all these four have the same status. But technically, that's incorrect. Notice fire has a unique status with reference to the pot and water. Fire is the direct means of cooking, whereas pot and water are secondary in their function. So when we look at these four, we accept all four. All four are absolutely necessary. But we have to understand the relationship between the four. Of those four, jnanam is primary, since knowledge destroys the ignorance that causes suffering, and then bhakti, karma yoga, and dhyana are also necessary. We didn't say they're not. They're absolutely necessary, but they're necessary in a secondary manner. That's what Shankara means to, means to teach here. So he says, pakasya van hivat, his first metaphor. Just like fire is the direct means of cooking, in the same way, knowledge is the direct means of gaining moksha. Now, bef before we move on, at, if we had a question-answer session, uh, many people would ask at this point, what about... We hear so many stories of someone going into a cave and meditating, and they meditate for months and years, and then they emerge from the cave enlightened. 
how are we, we to explain that? It looks like meditation made them enlightened. Looks like. Well, it's not hard to imagine that before that fellow went into the cave, probably he was already on a spiritual path, right? Meaning, probably he had already been exposed to these teachings, certainly the teachings of the ancient rishis, but it's likely that whatever exposure he had before going into the cave, whatever he heard wasn't enough to make him enlightened. After all, that's why he went to the cave. He wasn't enlightened. Then sitting in the cave, we said meditation was important. Meditation was not just important, essential. But meditation is essential in a secondary manner. So imagine him sitting in that cave. He had heard these teachings before going into the cave, but those teachings didn't sink in, so to speak, to use American expression. Um, but his long meditation allowed those teachings to finally sink in. So the meditation allowed the bodha, the knowledge, to remove ignorance. So he, mer he emerged after years of meditation, but it wasn't the meditation in and of itself that made him enlightened. It was this bodha, this knowledge, that made him enlightened. There's a joke, this, this nice Indian joke. When uh, this idea, you hear something, but you don't understand it immediately. You understand it only later. You've probably been, been in a gathering where, where somebody tells a joke, everyone laughs. And then a second or two later, somebody laughs later. <laughs> Their laughter is delayed because it took them a few moments to get the joke. In India, there's a rather sarcastic way of referring to such a person as a tube light. Tube light means of fluorescent lights, which the old fluorescent light fixtures would, when you turn on the switch, they wouldn't immediately light up. They'd flicker and flicker and come on finally at a later time. The point is, knowledge sometimes doesn't sink in immediately and sometimes that meditation is necessary to allow that, that knowledge to finally sink in. That's how we understand all these stories of somebody who's meditated in a cave for years and emerges enlightened. I bring that up because it's a very common uh, uh, question that comes up in this context. Okay, let us move on to verse 3. <clears throat> Pardon me? The last line. They discussed. So, jnanam vena mokshaha nasadhyati. I said, uh, we, uh, it was explained, right? Jnanam vena, without knowledge, mokshaha, liberation, nasadhyati, cannot be gained because it is knowledge that removes the veil of ignorance, revealing your true inner divinity. It is that recognition of your inner divinity that brings suffering to an end. One final point about this, going back to those four. Notice when Shankara says in the first half, bodhaha anyasadhane byaha, he, that eka sadhanam, that moksha eka sadhanam, where Shankara says in the first line that knowledge is the one means for gaining moksha. Please note, he's not saying knowledge is better than meditation. Knowledge is better, this is important. He's not saying knowledge is better than meditation. Knowledge is better than bhakti. Knowledge is better than karma yoga. He's not saying that. All the four are required, as we just said. Do, is fire better than the pot? Is fire better than the water? All of those are required. What he's distinguishing here is between a direct means 
and an indirect means, a primary and a secondary means. Knowledge is the primary means of, of putting an end to suffering, whereas bhakti, karma yoga, dhyana, and many other practices are all absolutely essential, crucial, but they're required not as primary means, they're required as secondary means. Okay, now verse 3. Avirodhitaya karma, avirodhitaya karma, na vidyam vinivartayet, na vidyam vinivartayet, vidya vidyam nihantyeva, vidya vidyam nihantyeva, te jastimira sanghavata, te jastimira sanghavata. These are wonderful verses. I mentioned before, this is my favorite text uh, of Shankaracharya, and I'm just so happy to be uh, teaching this and sharing this time with you. So, karma, avirodhitaya karma. Karma means any action. Action is not only physical, action can be mental, action can be, can be vocal, so therefore, the practice of bhakti requires mental prayer, sometimes oral prayer, sometimes you do puja. The, the practice of meditation also requires mental effort, mental action, sometimes oral if you're reciting a mantra out loud. The point is here, his use of the word karma is to refer to these other spiritual practices, including raising your kundalini, doing yogasanas, and, and everything else. So, <clears throat> he says that these karmas, these other spiritual practices, which are karmas, are na avidyam vinivartayet. Na vinivartayet. They do not remove a vidyam, a vidyam. Notice the words get run together. Na, a vidyam, na vidyam. These other spiritual practices don't, in and of themselves, remove ignorance. Why? Avirodhitaya. Because they are not, in and of themselves, opposed to ignorance. Knowledge is opposed to ignorance. Knowledge and ignorance can't coexist, right? So if ignorance is present and knowledge comes, that ignorance gets destroyed. But notice, huh, good example. If ignorance is present and you pray, does that prayer remove the ignorance? It doesn't. That prayer is a karma, it's a spiritual practice, but that spiritual practice is not opposed to, to, uh, to ignorance. So therefore, karma, these other spiritual practices, aviroditaya, because they are not opposed to ignorance in the same way as knowledge is opposed to ignorance, na avidyam vinivartayet, they cannot remove. Uh, ignorance. In some rare cases, spiritual... Pro oh, this is a bad joke. I apologize in advance. The joke is, is about... And this is Puja Swamiji's joke, my guru's joke. He said, in some rare cases, spiritual practices can make your ignorance worse. That sounds so strange. How can a spiritual practice make your, make your ignorance worse? He says, suppose you're practicing yogasanas, postures and you decide to do this shirasasana headstand. He said, if you are ignorant, already ignorant, and you do this headstand, when you do the headstand, it makes all the blood run to your head. It makes you think more. And according to my guru, if you're ignorant and you think more, you get even more confused. <laughs> His joke. Anyway, the point is, Yogasanas are not opposed to ignorance. Prayer is not opposed to ignorance. Karma yoga is not opposed to ignorance. Knowledge 
is opposed to ignorance. Knowledge destroys ignorance. Something very obvious that, that we sometimes overlook. We have many spiritual practices, but these spiritual practices have different purposes. They have different goals. Uh, of a common metaphor is to compare these spiritual practices to a toolbox. You have a toolbox with several tools. A hammer is a really good tool for pounding in nails. A hammer is not very good if there's a loose screw. If there's a loose screw, you need a screwdriver, but that screwdriver won't help you with a nail. You get the point. A toolbox full of tools, each tool has a different purpose. We could make the same observation about our spiritual practices. We have many, but each of those spiritual practices has a different purpose. Bhakti has a very important purpose to purify our minds and hearts, to invoke God's grace for the long spiritual journey that lies ahead. Crucial. Yogasanas, they have an important, in fact, an overlooked importance of yogasanas. If you want to meditate, for an extended period of time. Suppose you want to meditate for one hour. Can you meditate for an extended period of time without needing to constantly readjust your posture? Most people get uncomfortable. They need to readjust their posture again and again. The whole point of the practice of yogasanas is to make your body limber enough so that you can remain seated in meditation for extended periods of time. The point I'm making is we have many sadhanas, many spiritual practices. Each of them have a specific purpose. The specific purpose of bhakti is not to remove ignorance. The specific purpose of yogasanas is not to remove ignorance. Does it mean they're useless? Certainly not. The specific purpose of a screw is, uh, is to screw in a screw. It's not for hammering in nails. This is the, the, the metaphor. So, the specific purpose of what we're doing right now, which is called Atma Vichara, self-inquiry. We're using the teachings of Vedanta to seek this particular knowledge the knowledge that can remove the veil of ignorance calling, covering atma, this particular spiritual practice can remove that veil of ignorance and lead to knowledge. So, point is, every spiritual practice has a specific purpose. We should differentiate them. Then, vidya avidyam nihanti eva. Vidya, knowledge, nahanti, removes, destroys, avidyam, ignorance. There's one little word here which is crucial. The last word, nihanti, eva. Here it means alone. Knowledge alone removes ignorance. Not bhakti, not, not uh, karma yoga, but again, can, just to reflect on our prior discussion, when I say bhakti doesn't remove ignorance, doesn't mean bhakti isn't necessary. Bhakti is absolutely necessary because you won't get that knowledge without bhakti. You won't get that knowledge without karma yoga. You won't get that knowledge without meditation. So please don't make a mistake here. But since knowledge is a direct means for removing that ignorance, that's what Shankara is saying here. Vidya eva, knowledge alone, avidyam nahanti. Knowledge alone removes ignorance. And he gives another metaphor, the second of many. Just like what? Tejas timra sanghavat. That vat affix means like or as. It's often used to introduce a metaphor, a drishtanta, vat, just as tejas, here it means light, just like light 
and we have to use the verb from the prior line. Light nahanti, light removes. T uh, timara sangha. Sangha means a, a mass of timara darkness. Just like light alone, we'll bring that word down too. So nahanti eva, light alone removes darkness. And that is a metaphor for how knowledge alone removes ignorance. When we say knowledge alone removes ignorance, that sounds a, a little bit like these fundamentalist preachers. You can imagine a fundamentalist preacher standing up and saying, um, only if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, only through the exception of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, only then can you be freed from eternal damnation. That's fundamentalism, that word only. Here we have that word only. Is Shankaracharya being like that fundamentalist <laughs> preacher? Only knowledge can remove ignorance? As only Jesus Christ can save you from damnation? This is not fundamentalism. This is common sense. Knowledge alone removes ignorance like light alone removes darkness. If I say light alone removes darkness, is that a fundamental, am I being narrow-minded? Can you find <laughs> anything else that removes darkness? Only light removes darkness. This is not being narrow-minded or, do or being dogmatic. That's the word I'm looking for. This is not dogmatism. It's common sense. Knowledge alone removes ignorance, just like light alone removes uh, darkness, not dogmatic. There's a really nice point I'd like to bring out here. I'm looking at the uh, clock just to, to see if uh, we'll, we'll maybe take some time on this point. Very important teaching of Vedanta. It may come a little bit later in the text, but it seems crucial to introduce this right now. So far, discussion has been a little bit, ab I won't say abstract, but conceptual. And what I'd like to do here at the end of today's class is to bring these teachings and make them more connected to our experience. We're seeking to remove the veil of ignorance that covers that inner divinity called Atma. That Atma is not something completely unknown to you, but it's partially unknown to you, and I'd like to explain that. This is really an important teaching. That Atma, you, you've, no doubt you've heard, Atma is, is often defined as Sat-Chit-Ananda. Uh, Sat, real, unborn, uncreated, unchanging. Chit, consciousness, awareness, knowingness, if we can make a word out of that. And Ananda, bliss, fullness, completeness, perfection. Focus on that word consciousness, chit. Atma is consciousness. In fact, one of the four Mahavakyas is Pragnanam Brahma. Brahma, that ultimate reality, is Pragnanam consciousness. Here we're not talking Brahman, we're talking Atma, but they're ultimately they're revealed to be the same. Anyway, coming back. Consciousness, Atma, ultimately, is consciousness, not just ordinary consciousness, but consciousness which is unborn, uncreated, consciousness which is also ananda. Now, here, here's the point I want you to consider. Are you conscious or not? Of course. You have, you have no doubt. You know that you are 
conscious. That consciousness is present in your experience right now. Because of consciousness, you're able to see me and hear me and understand what I'm saying. All of that is because of consciousness or awareness. We use these words synonymously. Consciousness, awareness, same thing. Consciousness or awareness is present right now in your experience. And that consciousness, we're going to see that so much more as we go through this text, so be patient. But what we're going to discover is that consciousness is your true inner nature. Atma is consciousness. But you're thinking, wait a minute. Consciousness is always there. I already know I'm conscious. Con in fact, this is a common problem. Anything that is constantly present with us, we tend to take for granted. <laughs> Some people who are, who are constantly in the presence of their spouses, unfortunately, take their spouses for granted. Not a good thing, as you understand. Here, consciousness is constantly present in every experience you have. You're conscious of whatever happens right now. You're conscious of what happens later in the day. You're conscious of what happens in your dream. You're conscious of waking up tomorrow. Consciousness is present in each and every experience, leading us to conclude that consciousness is something ordinary. Consciousness is an ordinary aspect of being a human being. We're all conscious. What's the What's the big deal, to use the American expression? It is a big deal. What makes it a big deal is the fact that your consciousness is not at all ordinary. The consciousness that's present in your experience right this moment is actually extraordinary in nature. For example, and this is, this is all Everything I'm about to say, briefly, is covered in great detail later in this text, but I th it's important to bring some of it in right now, as I said, so that our discussion is not so conceptual, so that our discussion relates to your experience. In particular, your experience of being a conscious being right now, this very moment. The consciousness that's present in your experience is extraordinary. How? Well, you think that consciousness is stuck inside of you, or worse, stuck inside your head. Conscious, that consciousness that's present in your experience right now is not stuck inside your body or stuck inside your head. The consciousness that's present in your experience right now has no edge, has no boundary. Your skin has a boundary. Your sense of touch has a boundary. Your consciousness doesn't end here. The consciousness present in your experience pervades the universe. Consciousness is all pervasive. The consciousness present in your experience is all pervasive. We're going to discover how that's true as we go through the text. The point I'm making now is we're discussing the conscious. When we say Atma, we're discussing the consciousness present in your experience right now. Let me share with you a pet peeve. Some people use the expression the Atma. Swamiji, please tell me what is the Atma. When you use that article, the, in English, it turns Atma into a thing. The paper, the chair, the cloth. Not the Atma. Why? Atma is not a the. Atma is you, your essential conscious nature, that inner divinity. Therefore, it's not the Atma. That Atma is all 
pervasive consciousness. As I said, we are going to establish in great detail, vividly, how it is that your consciousness that you think is ordinary is all pervasive. And further, look at this. If that consciousness is all pervasive, it's the same consciousness that's inside me, the same consciousness that's inside you. There is one all-pervasive consciousness present in all living beings. And further, that consciousness wasn't born when your body was born. That consciousness pre-existed the birth of your body. And when your body dies, that consciousness will go on existing utterly unchanged. All of this we will see in detail in this text. The point I'm making is that the Atma, in the term Atma Bodhas, knowledge of Atma, self-knowledge, we're not talking about knowledge of the Atma. We're talking about knowledge of your own consciousness. The consciousness present in this experience, the consciousness you think that's so ordinary, we're going to discover going forward how that consciousness is extraordinary. So now going back to my earlier point, that consciousness is partially known to you. Partially known means what? You know that you are a conscious being, but you may not know that that consciousness is all pervasive, unborn, uncreated, eternal, limitless, full, complete, partially known, partially unknown. That's why we use this metaphor of the veil of ignorance. This metaphor is so per perfect because a veil can cause this partial, partial, partial obscuring. Many of you know in, in, uh, <laughs> in Rajasthan, all the ladies, not just in Rajasthan, but especially, <laughs> pardon me for being silly, especially in Rajasthan, the ladies all cover their faces. But, <laughs> good. <laughs> but notice when the lady's face is covered, the, the, the palu, or the what, whatever it is, is, is semi-opaque. You can see her face partially even when it's covered. That veil is semi-transparent or semi-opaque, ends up meaning the same thing. That veil that covers the woman's face is not completely opaque, it's semi-opaque, it partially obscures her face. In the same way, this veil of ignorance that covers your true nature is semi-opaque, so to speak. It partially obscures your true nature insofar as you know that you are conscious. You know that you are a conscious being, but you don't know the true nature of that consciousness. When the light of knowledge removes the so-called veil of ignorance, that's another metaphor, in the absence, when the veil is present, consciousness is known indistinctly, like the lady's face can be seen indistinctly through her, over, through her uh, cloth. But when that veil of ignorance is removed, you discover your true nature in all its glory. We call it inner divinity for a reason. Divine means that which shares, that which has divine qualities, godly qualities. Something about you is divine. Pardon a joke. If you look into a mirror, you won't see that divinity. When I look in a mirror, I don't see anything divine. I see this funny looking body and face. That inner divinity is discovered in its glory only when 
that veil of ignorance is removed, that veil which partially obscures your true nature as Satchirananda Atma. All of this is going to be explained in so much more detail, but it's crucial that we listen to these teachings with the right orientation. We're not gaining knowledge about the Atma. You already have lots of, no that kind of knowledge, we'll call it information. You already have knowledge about the computer. You have knowledge about the building. You have knowledge about the car. You have knowledge about the art of cooking. We can go on forever. This is not, this knowledge is utterly unlike all those other kinds of knowledge. In fact, that's the subject of our, of our next verse, which we're going to see in the next class. We're going to discover how knowledge of Atma is not knowledge of something. You'll say, you'll say, eight cheese, one, one object out there. This is not knowledge of some thing. It's knowledge of your true self, Satchirananda Atma, and as such, it is absolutely unlike all other kinds of knowledge, as we'll see in our class next week. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma Kashchadduhka Bhagbaveta Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya Murityor Ma Amritangamaya Om Shanti 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 Om Tatsat. <laughs>